here to talk about facility best practices, so probably not going to talk a lot about fabric and, and Rocky <laughs> and any of that stuff here. Um, and so what I want to do, I'm, I'm Wade Vincent from HP. I'm here in Houston. Um, I was going to kick off with sort of kind of a survey uh, of things that we've seen across deploying lots of systems, and then uh, and then uh, BP. You heard a lot from TAC, and then Total Energies are going to talk about some of what they are seeing as best practices. Yeah, I don't know, and that was that's what I saw too. <laughs> like, works sometimes and then doesn't. Here's our page. Um, and so I kind of started with a, a recent picture that was in the in the media. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's Aurora. Aurora uh, uh, Rick, Rick there, Stevens. Yeah. At, at, at Oregon, that was in the Chicago Magazine. You know, a lot of times. Uh, you know, people think the images are fake. You know, and it just, I mean, it kind of looks like it. And so uh, yeah, right. o over 300 racks, over 150 kilowatts rack, no fans, all liquid cooling. You know, I was one of the happiest guys in the world when HP acquired acquired SGI, and then we acquired Craig. So I mean, the thermal mechanical guy, I'm like, woo -hoo. You know, Half my team's in Chippewa Falls, half still in Houston. So, uh, so we're really excited about it. But in addition to delivering these, to these monster systems, um, we've been delivering quite a few systems in, I'll call it the 300 watt processor here. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we started looking at Gen 10 and a half, uh, um, and, and, I, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm going to call it a, a survey for lack of a for lack of a better a better name. And so, you know, you know, thinking about the systems that have been eight to 100 racks, and and not just focusing on the U.S. because there's different voltages here. Or, or HPC. So some of it, you know, I, I want to just cover, just to kick us off to have a conversation, I picked seven what I'd call trends. I think I did. Yeah, you guys saw the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I picked seven trends that are in no particular order, and any one of the trends, you know, we can go schedule a, a half-day conference and go talk about <laughs> any one of the trends. So there's not a lot of time here, but I just, I wanted to touch on a few of them. We can go deeper or shallower. And really, it's it's to, you know just to get the dialogue going at the at the facility level, and I'll pick I'll pick an easy one I think for this crowd well because in the U S, um, you know, power's going up you know and so two hundred eight one twenty went to two hundred eight volt delta mm -hmm. and uh, and all the native U S facilities took medium voltage down to four eighty you know and so now the question is what are we going to do a lot of the big government facilities just went 480 277 right away right but as enterprises and smaller folks started doing it they're like man i can't get 277 volt power supplies right. <laughs> for my switches and for my storage and for anything else i can't get pdus i can't get transformers for 277 and so even now a lot of the big us government facilities are doing european power right so 415 240 and, and so you know it, you think it would be kind of an easy decision to say, well, let's just go to 415, 240 and, and call it a day. You'd think it would be an easy decision. But, but sometimes these things are hard to get. And one of the things about, about 480, 277 is everybody wants that last little bit of performance. Well, that little bit between 240, 240 and 277. 277, that's just a little bit more that you can, that you can eke out. Um, I think one of the things we found early on maybe – the hyperscalers did it first, so I, we did we did a lot of modular data centers uh, at HPE. I still keep my my email alias the Podfather at <laughs> HPE.com. I think I don't know if Ron gave me that eight years ago, um, but a lot of the hyperscalers went to four fifteen right away, and now many of the colos are going to four fifteen. And so back in the early days, it was hard to get four fifteen right. two forty equipment in the U.S. But I think it's becoming more and more standardized. The flip side of it is the power supply vendors around the world who build power supplies for us and Lenovo and Dell and Cisco and Mellanox are like, okay, we're done. We're, we're not we don't want to build any more 277. Here's one. Here's the CRPS from Delta 277, and this is what you get, you know, because we don't think the Open 19 or Open Compute. And 277 volt is a whole different regulatory class. So if you, you know, 277, once you're above 250, those power supplies are hard. Now, you make the decision at the transformer, and again, not, not going any deeper than this, but you're, it's, when you have medium voltage and you're putting in a new two and a half megawatt service, you know, instead of having to take the step down from medium voltage to 480, 277, 
uh, have them take it down to 415, 240, and then you're done. Or you do it on the row power panel or, or PDU at the room level. Um, we've had to develop with one of our partners smaller transformers. So for example, we've got a we've got a 4400 watt transformer that we use to feed switches across rows of rack. Our servers still have 277, but we, we just because we're cray and we're in all these big US government facilities, we keep 277 around, but our switches, to all, all the acquisitions we've had, you know, uh, uh, the three cars, uh, Aruba's, uh, uh, the, the, the cluster store, that, none of that has 277 in it. And so we even have a 100 kilowatt transformer that's six years. And so we, we're able to go develop that, but I just, I just brought that in as, as one example. I'm just curious, how many folks in here are actually running 277? Hmm. Two. It's <laughs> dropping. How many of you are, are 415, 240? Okay. Are the rest of you 208 Delta? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody's 208. Some of us are together and didn't, and didn't raise their hands. <laughs> well, like us, we have part of our room is 208, which was the old data center, and then the expansion is all 415. Uh, and it's just, we adopted the 415 back in 2015, I guess, yeah, 16, yeah, okay. 2015, 16, so it's been a few years, and it's been working pretty well. Um, unfortunately, you're paying for the IEC 309 connectors, uh, and there's a the fee for the PDUs, because usually oh, really? when you get that, okay. yeah. Where, where, whereas before? The NEMAs were just that were cheaper. NEMAs were cheaper. Um, because, NEMAs are smaller. Yeah. I've, I've, I've actually been a bigger fan of NEMAs lately than I thought I would be. Yeah. And, but, but, but the regulatory agents can let you do a NEMA at 415, 240 if you, if you tag it. Okay, if you but, tag but, it. But, yeah, well, that's one that's thing different. we did is, is for Frontera, we actually, uh, uh, it's 415 bus bars up above the ceiling. And then we, instead of doing the IEC 309 connector, we actually hardwired the PDU into the bus plug. Um, we did blow our bu one of our bus plugs during our power event. Uh, we actually had a bus plug blow, and the, the vendor's like, can you send that back to us? We need to figure out how that failed. <laughs> so. Well, that's, that's a good segue into the next topic, and that was you, you talked about power failures, and you talked about your next generation, the 2025 system going above 100 kilowatts a rack. But, you know, in the U.S., we derate. It just mm -hmm. is what it is. 150 amp circuits, really 120. And unfortunately, the bus plug, the IEC bus plug, it, it, in Europe they call it 125 amp. I don't know why we call it 100 amp in the U.S. It's the same but darn thing. And so, if Europe out of the same, you get 125 amps out of a plug in Europe, that you only get 80 amps in the U.S. You know, at 415, 240. I don't know. Can, can we influence the industry to change that? It, it, it's sort of ridiculous. Um, but what it means is that only at 480, 277. Each 150 amp circuit is exactly 100 kilowatts, and so if you've got some level of resiliency or redundancy, you know, and, and it's now is how many whips do you want to run to the rack, and what's your resiliency? I think everybody was thinking, okay, it used to be I have an A whip and a B whip, you know, from my PDUs, and whether I had UPSs or other generators behind them, it really didn't matter. But I, and now I think it was pretty easy, especially at 208 to have two A whips and two B whips. So at 208 in a colo, each whip was 17 kilowatts. So, so with today, I think everybody in the world in U.S. data centers can tell the story that they can do 35 kilowatts of A and 35 kilowatts of B at, at 415, 240, or even 208 delta. But as power is going up, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. I mean, how many of your facilities are going to want to bring in the fifth whip or the sixth whip right. if you want that? And again, as power is going up, I mean, I've got another slide in here, but I mean, we've got we've got servers that are over a kilowatt for mm -hmm. you, and that's kind of pedestrian now. Even enterprise folks are seeing over a kilowatt for you, and as you fill up the rack, I was looking at your uh, your uh, Longhorn Six uh, uh, air cooler. Yeah, yeah. Now, now your limit for twenty five. Uh -huh. I know it was two away, but you both did on that cool terra rear door on that. No, no, no. We did not put the cool terra rear doors on those. That's all. Uh, in fact, we have in row cooling still in that portion of the data center where okay. the, those are at. We'll, we'll cover that one along yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. These, these top of trucks, but the point is that's something to think about. And, and one of the things in HPC we see is, you know, just like, you know, uh, uh, servers don't have to be serviced because nothing ever fails, right? <laughs> uh, PDUs, power supplies. I think most people want to have power supply resiliency 
because the 12 volt or 54 volt power supply in the server, they, they can fail. Right. And you'd hate to have nodes down. And so I think as most people uh, are saying, okay, if I've got a multi-node system with multiple power supplies, then I want to make sure that I can, you know, if I have six power supplies, let me have five of them on. Right. But I'm hoping that the industry is changing, that they're not going to say, well, if I've got six power supplies, oh, I need to put three on A and three on B. <laughs> Right. Uh, ma matter of fact, we're, we're uh, our, our new uh, uh, Project Cirrus uh, HPC colo business, um, uh, we're at a high enough power level where we're saying, hey, you know what? We want the colo to give us three feeds, guarantee that those three um, uh, 35 kilowatt feeds are always up, mm -hmm. but any two of them are on. And so I think, I think that's what you're going to see. So as you talk to your facility folks, you know, it's not really... At the power supply level, you want N plus one. At your facility level, you really want N plus one. You know, you, the, the, the cost to bring N plus N, especially N plus N at the highest power level, I mean, if, the in, if everybody in the industry did that, this would be billions of dollars right. in new data centers that had to be spent. Billions, if, so, if everybody had to keep up at N plus N. Um, one of the other things, um, let's see, that, oh yeah, one of the other things that we've been looking at is can I down clock fast enough in the event of a power loss that I can degrade performance because that power loss is a transitory thing? Right. You know, it might be over the weekend and maybe I'm not 100% performance, but maybe I've got somebody on site who can replace a power supply, uh, um, you know, or even an unscheduled event or even a maintenance event. So that's one of the things that, you know, are we able to put enough capacitance in cheap power supplies and react fast enough so that we can take whatever internal clocking mechanism AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, Next Silicon gives us, and can we, can we clamp down fast enough? And, and I would have said two years ago, yes, we're already doing it. But unfortunately, in the arms race that has become synonymous with silicon, when you buy an NVIDIA part that is 350 watts for several hundred milliseconds, microseconds, <laughs> it's actually can be 700 watts. And if that power goes into your power supply, then it actually hits your circuit. Mm -hmm. And so the actual power, the amperage that and everybody's guilty of, well, AMD, I'm Intel, and NVIDIA. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm telling the truth on everybody. <laughs> is that the instantaneous power, the voltage regulators on board the servers used to deal with it, they don't anymore. It is riding through into the bulk rectifier, into the 54 or 12 volt, and the minute it hits that, the input plug and the input 16 amp breaker is seeing it. And so while we were thinking that, oh, well, we have capacitance in the power supply, this, what was called, used to be called instantaneous power, or, or, or right. continuous power, the industry calls it TDP, thermal mm -hmm. design power, because they say, no, no, you only have to design your cooling for your thermal design power, but the reality is now, you've got to design your bulk power for the, for the, for the how, how, many, how many microseconds, and now all of a sudden your facility's got to deal with it. We have nice thermal magnetic trip breakers at PDUs and, and at the room level, but you still have to design for it at the worst case. Those breakers were there, when a fire or a short occurred to cut off the energy. They were not there because your yeah. actual load was drawing it for, you know, two, two, I, I think right now that the, I think right now the number is, is 200 microseconds. Yes. Because if you look at the capacitance of power supplies, 100, mm -hmm. 180, but as these things are pulling that power level for more than 200 microseconds, which I've seen it happen on, on Ice Lake, I've seen yeah. it happen on uh, on a can happen on B one hundreds A one hundreds H one hundreds they're all so, so you, very important to be thinking about you're not going to be able to design your facilities to N plus N contiguous and stay in business it's just it's just too cost prohibitive yeah one other little aspect that's a side thing of that is is harmonics um, and I think Frontier has experienced this too at Oak Ridge um, when you're getting these if you've got a synchronized MPI application that's running across all your nodes at the same time, they're all hitting that 100 microsecond peak when they're doing their computation and it gets synchronized. 
And we saw this with, with Frontera, when you're pushing your, your, your transformers at their derated load or close to it, you can start to induce these harmonics back to your transformers. You don't, you don't, you don't have active power against Well, not, in the, not at that part of the data center, because it was oh. very cost, <laughs> costly. All of those things used to be part of the double conversion right. of the BSs. That exactly. Had. exactly. And, and, and now that went away, Wait. because now, it, now it's not double conversion. Right. And then they used to be inside the bulk power factor correction of the power right. supplies. And everybody says, no, no, we need to take that out. Well, guess what happens with everybody? <laughs> right. And, and a lot of facilities used to have large enough air handlers and mm. other larger AC moving equipment that, that is, look, one AC device can make up for a lot of harmonics. Right. But now it's all it's all coming from raw DC. Uh -huh. Again, we saw a lot of this during our deployments of modular data centers at uh, at Microsoft and others because there's a 2.8 megawatt generator, and and when it steps back on. I mean, we literally put in code that we would only turn certain servers on every so often because of, because because of this, the Right, yeah. So something to keep in mind when you're building your new facility. Uh, cer certainly, if you're going to be pushing the power, uh, think about harmonics and conditioning. <laughs> you, you teed up this next one. I didn't intend to tee up for when you talked about your 25 kilowatt yeah. rack. And that is, where is where are we running out of air? Because if you have liquid in your data centers already, it's just at the perimeter right. most of the time, unless you've got a package air handler or a rooftop DX unit, you've got liquid in your facility. It's just at the perimeter. And so now you start to bring it into the rough, whether it's a, a rear door heat exchanger, a sidecar heat exchanger, or DLC in the rack. And, and so what we've been finding, and again, this is me taking a survey of lots of deployments and, and decisions people are making, is they're actually not at their limits on the cooling tower. Cooling towers are kind of over-designed, you know, from a delta and a delta T perspective. And so they said, hey, what can I do by, by actually bringing the water instead of to a, a, a computer or air handler, I can get 25% more capacity out of that water feed it by bringing it into the road. But that's math you have to go do. You have to go make sure your plant can deal with that. They can deal with the pressure drop. Because you don't want to break the, uh, the, the air conditioner in the room. Uh, uh, one of my fellow panelists said this morning, and I won't name them, is they were ready to go to warm water, and it turns out that their two facility water feed, one was for the cold water for people and regular air conditioners, and one was warmer water that they, 55, it wasn't really warm, and they were going to make it even warmer, 55 bad. They were going to make it even warmer, and it turns out somebody somewhere designed one of the air conditioners on the warmer water feed. And so now as such, they can't just go to the cooling tower for that because, because that would make that air conditioner. And, and it's called approach temperature. So talk to your facility people about approach temperature. This stuff is happening now. And I, I don't know, are any people in here, have you talked to your facilities or have you talked about liquid cooling and you don't do it because you're worried that liquid cooling is going to cause leaks and cause your, your data center to go down? Is anybody... Do we have people who really are just, you know, even enterprises now, I, I find, are putting, are putting water in it. It's, it's the trust of the water. Leaks are, I mean, leaks are usually pretty minor, though, in the system. I mean, you're not flooding your data center right. with a couple of node, little bitty tubes. I mean, and the major welded pipes and everything that's running through your facility, that's not where you're getting your leaks. You're getting your leaks in these quick disconnects right. or... In or the seals, seals that go bad and temperature swings, yeah, a little minor. Yeah, because there's, there's, there's no leak that would ever bring down a data center. <laughs> <laughs> large volumes of water have large problems. And, and, and by, by the way, what was it? The, what was it the, you said thousands of O-rings? I think, I think I have a few hundred of those same O-rings. O-rings, yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Right. Um, last thing is thermal mass. You know, people, look, water is coming. It's going to be there. It's so important for sustainability, but when you get it, when you take away air conditioners, you had a lot of thermal mass in the room, and so you had air handlers around the room, and so you knew that you could sustain the loss of a single air handler, but there's no such thing as resilient water. Yeah, you can put a continuous loop, and you can read water from two sides, and you can put N plus one chillers on it, but even Craig, <laughs> even SGI, even HP, we said one water loop into a rack. And if something happens to that one water, it's down. 
And so that's something you just got to accept. You got to start having a yeah. conversation of when you don't have air, air had a lot of thermal mass, you could, you could survive through that, that fall. We had a different challenge on, so our Houston data center, different than our one in France, because in Houston, yeah. we're actually sharing with the facility of the building. So we're using their cooling tower and their chill water loop. And we notice around 6.30 every morning, we have a big differential pressure drop when they're starting up the high rise. And so we're having to turn on booster pumps to start sucking water out of those pipes because we're not getting the pressure. So those are some of the water resiliency issues when you're in a shared environment mm -hmm. or using someone else's loop that you don't really have full control over. Oh, actually, you help me segue to the next one, shared <laughs> environment. So this might be an advanced topic for most of you in the room, but a rack CDU versus a row CDU. When I've got the big row CDU in pack, mm -hmm. Pangea, any of the systems that the Craig EX systems, we have 750 kilowatts, 600 kilowatts, 1.6 megawatts CDUs. Right and we share them for some level of resiliency. But the problem is when you're sharing water, the challenge when you're sharing water is those guys have to communicate together. Because again, you've got, you know, you, 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 you've got the, uh, the, the head unit you know, and, and two subservient units and, and they, they auto rotate who's mm -hmm. in charge and something happens, there's like an IO storm and all of a sudden they all think they're subservient. <laughs> So they all shut down at the same time. So the minute you start sharing, and you think that so I'm telling the story here, the minute the minute they all start sharing, it, it's you, you you think you've got resiliency because you've got oh I've got bigger CDUs that can feel it. The other thing that you have when you put in, and again, there's less of them. You think that they can be lower cost, they're bigger, they're outside of the racks, they're easier to service. But you know, HP a couple of generations ago, we we looked at you know we looked, we surveyed the industry. We put out an RFI, and the, the people that won was Acetec. And I don't know how many of you know Acetec, but Acetec came from the gaming industry, and they had a little pump on the nose. But as such, their in-rack liquid-to-liquid CDU was passive. Mm. It was cheap. It was easy. It literally couldn't fail. It was just the radiator. And I wouldn't have thought you know, that that would change my world, but I'm like, wow, I, I don't have to worry about that shit. I can test in my facility. So I really fell in love with a rack-based rack based CDU, as long as that rack-based CDU, you've got the resiliency, you understand the fault domain on it. The other thing we learned, and I don't know, I think the story was on uh, Nick Dubay, who was our lead person helping deploy Frontier. He was on uh, the Cube at, uh, at, at, at FC22, and he talked about some chemistry issues, and he was <laughs> trying to bring up the system. And so if, if you've got room scale, Every single IT rack is susceptible to the bad chemistry behavior of the largest single waterfall. Whereas if I've got a rack-based CDU, that secondary loop is contained in itself. And so at the room level, most chemistry is survival. You know, because you got large coils in it, mm -hmm. you don't have small orifices, you know, you're not as much worried about, you know, the, 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 the facility takes care of it. But when you get to the IT level with these very small right. channels and everything else, there's something to be said that I want my fault domain, in case I have bad chemistry somewhere else, I don't want it to bring down more than the nose in the rack. Um, and, and, and so, um, so, so I think all, all, of you, all of you guys have deployed uh, uh, just room scale CDU. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I learned a new word when we deployed it called de zincification. De zincification? Yeah. Okay. And that's where we found out because when we deployed Pangea 1 back in 2012, we put an eighth of the size in Houston and we were getting leaks out of the brass valves and it was because of the rust inhibitor we were putting into the CDUs. We found out the ROHS difference between the brass that goes into Europe <coughs> has less zinc in it than the brass that can come into the US and what the rust inhibitor was doing was leaching out the zinc and creating these crack paths and all the brass valves. So <laughs> takes down the whole system when your room level CDU is leaking over de-zincification. <laughs> yeah, we could, we, we, we could spend a whole couple of days talking about chemistry. The, the, key, the key things are pH between 7 right. and 9, and, and, and that changes. And if you sit a bucket of water somewhere, over time, it, it becomes acid on its own. It's a, it's, Stephen Dean taught me this uh, from SGI. It's just a natural process with water. But if you, if you just left the bucket of water there, 
over time, the H2O, mm -hmm. it, you, you, you measure it one day, you come back six months later, the, the, it's more and more absent. It's a universal mm -hmm. solvent. <laughs> People don't think about that. So, so the pH you've got to maintain between seven and nine by adding acids over time, and, and you, you you add a lot, but you don't want to go too far. And then you know, and then and then when do you add it again? And then you're also adding what we call azoles. And I don't know, I don't know what that term came from, but they're the yellow metal protectors. So when you talk about the thing, so so part of it is you know, if, again, if you're doing water and you want to come talk to me, we we. Or, know more about water than anybody in the world, I guarantee. <laughs> certainly, certainly after the frontier. But having the pH, having the azoles, understanding, protecting it. And of course, we ship out of Chippewa Falls, so it's been known to get cold up there. So we got to make sure we can ship it when it's when it's minus 40. And I like minus 40 because I don't have to say Fahrenheit or right. Celsius. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is one, and, and again, I, I, it was kind of nice that Tommy talked about it when he showed the nodes. Um, DLC uh, on, on the CP, right? That's what everybody's looking at. And we were doing it because did it make sense to put it somewhere else? You know, do I need to immerse the whole thing and cool the whole box? Um, but what we're seeing today and what we're hearing, and this is now going on for about 18 months, is that the vendors have liquid cooling, the silicon vendors have liquid cooling only skews. Now you would think they would just say, well wait, hold it at this tea case and that's good enough. No, no, but yeah. it's liquid cooling on. Wait, wait, no. I can put a big enough heat sink on it. <laughs> I can take care of all that. Um, oh, okay. Do I need to be my <laughs> I thought she was going to say, you're too loud for the room, for the meeting next door. Can you keep it down? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so the, the theory that there will be CPUs that are coming and those CPUs, there is a tangible benefit to keeping them colder. There's the, the, the arms race that silicon vendors have, all of them. They know that if they keep it colder, they can stack more HPM. They, 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 can, put more, more, they can put more active cores on it. I, I always say that, you know, the Cerebras guys, and, and I've got quite a few Cerebras systems of the wafer scale, and I'm like, you know, that's, that's been what Intel and AMD have wanted to do forever. They don't want to have to slice up the silicon and bend mm -hmm. it out. They just want to sell the whole piece of silicon, and if this corner doesn't work or that corner doesn't yeah. work, they, they, they don't care. Um, but, but what we're seeing is that there's a, there's a meaningful performance difference if you can run it cooler, uh, um, and, and it doesn't really cost any more you know, to the silicon vendor. He charges more for it because he can because he can charge more for it. Um, but where there are hundreds of billions of dollars of data center around the world that don't have liquid. A second ago I said every data center has liquid because it runs around the perimeter. But go survey Equinix, Digital Realty, Cyrus One, any of the colos, and look at how many of them have rooftop package area handlers or DX units and don't have a central chiller plant. And you're like, because we think, oh yeah, if you had it on the computer or area handler, I can bring it into it. Or they don't want to touch the, the, the perimeter cooling because it's attached to their human-based air conditioning. <laughs> right. You know, and, 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 and we see that a lot. And so the question is, you know, if, if we're doing, if, if this is meaningful as an industry, we got to have a conversation that says, you know, how do I get, is there still a benefit? Can I get that? And clearly I can get that. I can put water internal on my server and then I just aggregate that water somewhere else and dump it into the air. I think I, I wouldn't have talked about it in a public forum, but Zutacore has been pretty public about it, as has Equinix did a, did a study with Zutacore. Zutacore pumps refrigerant around, so they have liquid on the node, but they dump it into the air in the room so they don't attach to a CDU. And I'm like, okay, somebody's actually saying that's a viable technology, that, that it's worth it for performance-wise to use a liquid-cooled CPU. And I'm gonna say, as somebody who cares about the environment, it's worth it to save fans in the box. It's worth it to save fans in the data center. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe that liquid cooling in a non-liquid-cooled data center um, is worth it. 
Now, when I had this conversation with the executives at the Colos, they all looked at me like I, you know, had another <laughs> eye. You know, what well, doesn't it increase the efficiency of the air handlers to have a higher delta T? So if you're giving them heat, then yeah. they can think they should greater. run more efficiently. <laughs> yeah, but right. they, they but they like selling their room at eight kilowatts yeah. a rack yeah. all day, yeah. every day. Yeah. And if I'm telling them, I'm going to tell your customers that you can run some at 35 kilowatts a rack. We'll just tell them that we're not going to charge them for giving them the extra heat. Yeah, they they say so. So it's just something to think. So so as you look at these CPUs and GPUs, you know, uh, um, um, running it colder and running it colder with throwing more air at it is, is not sustainable. No. I mean, it's just, we, 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 we can't be doing that as an industry and it's gonna run out of steam. The surprising thing to me um, was how hard it is to get anybody to commit to where, what's the trend line, where it's going. Um, I was part of ASHRAE, the, the, the TC 9.9 committee. I was the compact guy on the committee uh, when it started, you know, 20 plus years ago, and there are trend lines that talk about where compute is going. And, and how do people design data centers if, if they don't know, you know, what the trend lines are? And, and, and so, you know, um, uh, we, put out a, we uh, put out a white paper with ASHRAE about 18 months ago. Uh, actually, Mark Steinke was at HPE and was uh, the lead author of that. And there was a trend line that showed why compute power is going up right now. So I would encourage people to, to, go, to go look for that paper. And uh, it talked about how you know, the trend line was a certain slope for years. And the prediction was it was going to go crazy, but it didn't happen. It flattened mm -hmm. out. And so now when we tell people, no, no, trust us, the power is going up again, part of that white paper was to show the model that, no, our model predicted it. Our model predicted that the trend line looked like this and multi-core 3D stacking technologies, you know, flattened it, and now it's going up again. Yeah, and, and so the question is, where is it really going to go? And, and I think that that's a conversation at the industry we need to have. And, and so, and so um, there was a, a uh, Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects, ARPA-E, just had a solicitation for some acronym that nobody knows the name for, C O O L E R C H I P S, cooler chips. It was one long <laughs> acronym that said the Department of Energy wants to invest money in it. Cooler chips. And, and uh, the FOA, whatever that stands for, they said, okay, in order to you get funded to do this work, and they're giving out $40 million or something like that to, to 20 different people, they said, you have to prove your technology can do 3,000 watts per year. You know, and so, you know, <laughs> I, being HPE, several of the people who were submitting, it came to us and said, hey, can we use an HPE server for this? You know, and I started reading it. And I'm going, where did they get that number from? You know, and I know some of the people at the DOE put the number together. And I said, what is a, what, what is, while it would be cool to figure out how we do 3,000 watts per U, what is the realistic answer right. for the, hundreds of billions of dollars of data centers, where are we really going? Because we can, the arms race, you know, is happening, right? Everybody's trying to jump over everybody and we can do custom compute, right? We're already at 200 kilowatts a rack with the Cray <coughs> EX and, and it literally it's, it's, the more we can cram in, it is what it is, but that's not what all of us want to solve in our data centers and our day job. What is the realistic number that says, okay, <laughs> Is it density for density's sake? Why not spread it out? And so, it's, and, and I'm gonna say, it, it's actually not GPUs. You know, a lot of people go, oh, but look at how powered GPUs are. But if you look at the boxes that people are offering, people are not shoving GPUs into crazy density because the majority of GPUs go in air-cooled data center. No, I'll say all of the GPUs go in air-cooled data Currently, center. Currently, yeah. Only now, with large language models, are people looking at GPUs at scale, at, at a supreme scale. And, and so people are buying two of them and putting in a rack. Heck, everything NVIDIA does with their DGX and their super pods and all that has been around air cooling. And, and, so, and so people aren't trying to force more GPUs into it. But CPUs are a different story. I mean, you know, see, you got two sockets flanked by DIMMs, one server for you, 
for maybe saying, hey, that's not optimizing a rack good enough. That's not optimizing a 64 port top of rack switch. So, so then there's a half heat node density. Right. And, so, and so if you look, okay, let's say, okay, realistically, one server per U, two servers per U is where it's at. And so in the CPU world, where are we today? So right now, uh, it's 400 watts, right? I, I couldn't say that in public, you know, about two months ago. <laughs> but, you know, 13 of the 30 AMD SKUs are, are 320 watts or greater. You know, and, and Intel might not have it there, but I bet I bet they're going to get there pretty close if they're not there today. I'm I think pretty I think, sure the Sapphire Rapids are three fifty watt yeah. SKUs. Cascade Lake AP is three fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or four hundred. You just bought the three, you bought the three fifty one. There was a four hundred <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's already there, and we all know. You know, uh, every, everybody knows that HBM and 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 just one hundred twenty eight cores. So it's easy to say it's five hundred. So we said okay, it's five hundred, and then. Where is DIMM technology going? You know, I defy somebody to tell me what the average power of DDR5 DIMMs are. We don't even know, right? How many applications <laughs> are really hitting DDR5 at all? Right. How much of it will be DDR5, even though it's less performant than HBM, you know, but it's just a numbers game, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be DDR5. And so I said, okay, and, and then how many, and then I want to, I want a DIMM sticks per core ratio. <laughs> and so, you know, how many, how many DIMM sticks and how many seconds? And so you start looking at those numbers, and then you look at the power supplies. I think we talked about 277 volt being hard, but how much can you really cram in? And, and the reality is the, the largest connector that is common across everybody from an input perspective is about 3,600 watts. So that's about 3,400 watts output. There are very few 3,400 watt output power supplies today. The industry's kind of standard, standardized around 3,000, um, but they're pushing it. And so you said, okay, all of these things I'm describing, I'll call it is, is that they're, I'll call it commodity-like, which makes them scalable, which means that everybody's going to want them and they're going to fill it up. And then you finally look at PDUs. And when I say PDU, I mean the plug strip at the back of the rack, because every power supply has to be protected by regulatory codes by a 16 amp breaker. I mean, that's just, that's the reality of it. And so, and so every time I put a power supply in, I need, I need to put that breaker into the rack somewhere, uh, into the rack. And so, you know, you, you didn't really dwell on the pictures of the back of Frontera <laughs> with the caboose on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, w you know, w these, these PDUs, they're, you know, they, you know, they, they go in the zero U space. But I'd be like, look, look, my zero U is really nice, right? And it's like <laughs> the, the thing sticks out, you know, uh, six inches behind the rack, uh, uh, and, and, and it's, it's got... I got PDUs today with 21 breakers in them, mm. with, with 21 outlets in them, with 21 breakers and 21 outlets to get to 100 kilowatts. So there, how many of them can you shove in? And so for all those things, I, I, I add it up and say, okay, the average rack is, I know that people have height restrictions or some people can do 50 for you, but basically a 40 U rack, 42, 44, because you always need fabric and top of rack switches. So, I mean, I think we're there as a commodity that it's 100 kilowatts a rack. Mm -hmm. Now, is that good or is that bad? I think it's a data point. It's 100 kilowatts. So as everybody's looking at technologies saying, okay, anything above that is custom. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. because, be, and, and people can do custom. Right? I can do custom. Dell can do custom. Lenovo can do custom. OCP is probably about a third of that right now. I think OCP stops at about maybe 35 kilowatts a rack. But, but that's the kind of message I want to send. And I'm not waiting for ASHRAE to publish a new paper and say, this is the new number. I think, I think RPE went a little far, saying yeah. 3,000. Yeah. But this is for things, this is for you folks to talk about. So as you're thinking about your next generation data center, talking to your facility people, you know, you're going to be buying servers in 2025 that, that you're not even going to have to work hard to make them 60 kilowatts. <laughs> I mean, it's just the reality. But the good news is, it's going to stop. It's going to stop at about 100. It's going to stop at about 100 mm -hmm. kilowatts. Yeah. So I'm sure you guys will have an opinion on that. <laughs> I got my last thing before I open up to the panel because, because again, this is my call call to action. <coughs> um, how many people here are not or, or don't live in Houston? Okay. So, so most, most people, there's a, there's a couple, 
there are a couple raise their hands so they can't see around. Um, but most people understand that, that Houston is hot and humid. And people would say, well, I can't do free cooling in Houston <laughs> because it's really humid. Now, now, for those of us who were here Monday, we actually had our one day of spring. You know, it was like 22% relative humidity. <laughs> yeah. you know. um, but there are a lot of hours. You know, there's 87, 60 hours a year. And servers don't need to be held at, uh, at, at, uh, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, you know I'm, I'm kind of like a 68. My wife's probably like a, you know, a 74. But servers don't care. Servers can run healthy. Let's just say they, they don't care at all at 85. Now their fans start ramping yeah. and things like that above that. But, but I mean, everybody's designing servers so that at 95 they get peak performance. It's just the way it's been done for 20 years is that nobody wants to give up performance at 35C95. Um, and can we build cooling technologies that can take advantage of that? And the answer is, even in Houston, we can, but it requires water. It requires that I stop blowing fans in the servers, that I stop blowing fans in the rack, that I stop moving it to co my computer mirror handler. We can do water-based cooling in Houston, uh, even as hot and humid it is, and, and reject it. Uh, um, and, and we can do we can do six thousand hours a year of free cooling in Houston. And if I can do six thousand hours of free cooling in Houston, I can do it in Singapore. Yeah. I can do it in Abu Dhabi, and and I mean, the rest of the world, man. I can I can do I can do the whole year of free cooling. So the point is that why is that so important? It's so important to get that heat into water and to reject it because that's the only way that, well, I'll call it a negative PUE or PUE <laughs> less than one, but the point is that every bolt amp coming in, you know, that's, that's the grid. We're using power. And, and by, by putting it into water, I now potentially have an ability to take what was a volt amp, a watt, and make it a watt again to be useful. In Europe, they pay people for that. It's called district heating. At NREL in Golden, Colorado, we use it to warm up the labs. Um, at our Project Cirrus data center in Quebec, the warm water is used there uh, to, uh, um, to run greenhouses in Quebec, because it's really cold in Quebec. In, in our project in Norway, that, that warm water is used uh, uh, for uh, fish farms. And so in, in the Arab Quarter, that warm water is used for desalinization plants. So only by going into water do we have the capability to convert that energy that we're all using mm -hmm. to do flops back into useful work. And so before, and so my comment to turn over the panel, if, if we're the energy capital of the world <laughs> here, working for these companies and energy's our business, you know, I think we've got to go there. So that's my, that's my impassioned, <laughs> impassioned plea. I know each of you folks, you know, had a couple things that you wanted to talk through uh, um, and I and I did it alphabetically by name and company, so I didn't, I, I didn't you know I didn't have to I didn't have to say what am I going by to talk about what what they think they, what the best practices they're seeing in their data center. We're having to move from 480 volt power to 415, 240, because vendors do not support 480 without yeah. a lot of work. On the cooling side, it I told a vendor at the end of 2018 <laughs> that we would not buy any more air-cooled systems <laughs> and they were flabbergasted uh, but they have since come out with liquid-cooled systems um, I think all of our compute nodes will be liquid-cooled from here on out I don't see any other way around it uh, the last air-cooled systems were uh, Skylake based and there's somebody that helped get those working at the design limit of our building was 35 kilowatts a rack. And everything since then has been 60 kilowatts a rack. Um, now whether that is uh, rear door heat exchangers or in-row coolers or direct-to-chip cooling or immersion cooling, that's up for debate. We've looked at all the different options, different times, and uh, all of our, all the companies represented here, I think, are uh, producing 
liquids for either EV battery cooling or they're trying to get into computer room cooling. I think there are still some issues. There are ones that we knew about back in 2018 uh, that I don't think have been addressed yet. Uh, a lot has to do with material compatibility. All the different parts on the motherboards, uh, there are still a number of them that degrade over time when they're immersed in hydro hydrocarbon-based fluids. Uh, until they figure out stuff like that, uh, our leasing companies are never going to let us return equipment to them after we've <laughs> dunked them. Um, and we're not real interested in having to clean the, the systems <laughs> when we pull them out because DIMMs fail. Yeah, you DIMMs fail, to, processors fail. Everything Stuff has, has to get replaced. Um, so we're pretty happy with the LC cooling, direct chip. We've done that already for three years, and we're very fortunate that Pack <laughs> took the, the bad. Took the plunge. Yeah, yeah. Took the, the we bleed. We, we, we took the bleeding edge. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, he says they've had 500 leaks. Yeah, out of the 8,000. We've so only far. had one leak, and yeah. ours is just a slightly different version than theirs. Right. So we've had a much better result, and we're very happy with what we've done. We'll see where it goes. Yeah, well, if we didn't have bad gaskets, we wouldn't have very many leaks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, just to echo what Ken said, I mean, you know, the problem with cooling nowadays is, is a lot of folks aren't at the same scale that, you know, a lot of our, our data systems are. So you, you really do need to do some competition and comparison. Um, you know, if you only got four or five racks, then the in-rack PDUs actually work pretty well. You know, our uh, CDUs, the in-rack CDUs, sorry, uh, for cooling distribution. Uh, it's only once you get to about 10 racks or so that, you know, having those central units start to be cost effective. Um, we try to price out whenever we do a big system. Um, you know, like on Lone Star 6, we looked at the direct liquid cooling. Uh, the nodes were actually designed with that on them, the AMD nodes. Um, uh, but they were converted for the immersion um, to go into the, into the immersion oil. Um, at the time, that was the best cost-effective solution for those options. So you, you kind of have to weigh uh, your options, uh, uh, but make sure you take into account total costs. That includes plumbing it into your facility's water. We were a bit lucky in that we had in-row coolers in the, in the machine room already, so instead of just having at the perimeter, we actually do have the cross pipes <laughs> going through on the rows, and so we were able to put the CDUs and tap in uh, to those. You, you, you make a good point, and I didn't say it in the in-rack and row, but I think there's this perception that if I do a row base, it saves me plumbing. And then, no, you, it's still secondary. No, no. <laughs> Every rack position it has, to get has a two-inch, and I'll say two-inch at 100 kilowatts. Maybe it's an inch and a half, a half inch yeah. and a quarter. But every rack position that you're designing for the future needs a, you know, I'll say one and a half. Okay. One and a half inch supply and a one and a half inch return. And it doesn't matter if it's a row CD or rack CD. You're bringing water to every rack. Anyway. Right. Um, or a tank. Or you're tank, still bring, yeah. You still bring in, yeah. You still have to have a heat exchanger. You still have to get the heat out of there and reject it out somehow. Just while you're on the immersion topic, though, what's really the value if you're not really increasing density, though? Because you've got these low racks that are spread out. So yeah. from our point of view, we had no cooling in the area where that was because that's where the cray was and had liquid cooling on the cray. And so we had no air handlers, no other way to cool that area of the room. And so we had to do something. And that's why we ended up opting for the immersion on that part of the room. Um, and the direct-to-chip cooling gets 80 to 90% of the heat out yeah. through the water. So that's... Well, uh, that's a actually, good... I want to correct that. Okay. It's closer it, to 75% from us. And, but... and it... <clears throat> The technology, and this, this, is what I, this, is my, this is what I do for a living, the technology is I'm going to put a cold plate on a CPU, and the best cold plate in the world gets, let's just say, 95% of the CPU heat out. And if you total up your box, depending on the CPU and DIMMs, I, I say that it's more of a, a two-thirds, one-third. And, and, you know, is, is that really, and, and that little bit matters, right? Because people go, oh, it's 75 or 80. And I'm like, no, it's 62 to 65%. <laughs> and that's, do, are you cooling just the CPU? CPU yeah. and DIMMs? Yeah. CPU, yeah. DIMMs, and NIC? Yeah. Right. And so power do, supply? So do the math yourself. Things. Go find out what percent heat is, and don't skimp on the residual that goes into air right. that can be cooled by 
sidecar coolers, river heat exchangers. Unless it was the Ice X cabinets, which were all self contained yeah. and room neutral switches, nicks, dims, everything, because all the air cooled stuff was cycling through that internal radiator. So you'd actually open the doors on the Ice X cabinets, you would cool your room. And, and, and we talked about a water drop to every rack, you know, and so. Clearly, the DLC can use the warmest water. Let's call it cooling tower only, but the residual might need a different quality of water. Mm -hmm. So maybe you need four hoses to every. <laughs> yeah. Again, it just you know, it, it's because because it all depends on what's in the rack. Well, the the room crack units. Our anticipation was as we move the computer racks to the. 55 degree loop and let it go up to 86, that the in-room cracks would have to move to the 44 degree right. loop. To pick up the residual. Right. Correct. Um, uh, echoing kind of what Kent said as well, 415 volt, I mean, we, we standardized on that um, several years ago just because it was a lot easier. Um, I think because the Europeans and the international use it a lot, it's more more commodity to its scale. I think that's why the power supply people don't want to touch do you, do 277. You, do you do it at, in the back room at the <clears throat> step down? Or uh, do you do it, you do it at, in, inside each row? Uh, we do it uh, at out, at the transformer level, so outside. The big transformers. The big transformers, yeah. So so 480 comes in, that's just what is building power, and then we transform the 480, 480 to 4. 480 comes into 3 megawatts, right. and then you transform, transform it, yeah. not each little in-room right. feed. Right. Whereas we're doing each in-room PDU. Actually, I have a combination. So the Stampede uses the old in-row PDUs where they were only 150 kilowatts each. And so yeah. they weren't, yeah, yeah. So we got a lot of those spread around the room. But tr we switched and moved to the big transformers with bus bars for Frontera. Um, definitely makes life a lot easier to, to manage the electrical that way. Um, you like the bus bars? Uh, I like the bus bars. They just, uh, they're pretty flexible. Um, we can get away with the direct connect as well. We can just hardwire our PDUs in. We work with APC just so that we get away from the IEC 309 connectors, not pay that extra couple hundred bucks a, when a whip. A, when you got an electrician <laughs> on site or a waterproof connector, yeah. that's what the yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, all the water's down below. Uh, the electrical's up above for us. Uh, yeah, so. Um, but yeah, so I, I suspect that 415 is where we're going to end up standardizing on now. Um, because getting 277 watt Power supplies has been so hard, and yeah, there just hasn't been enough of them out there. Not enough commodity of it. So, so we started, uh, we moved to liquid back in 2012 in France and in Houston at the same time. Um, they were a little bit ahead of us with our initial, it was an SGI based uh, Ice X system deployment. Um, it's kind of interesting though you say like the European voltage is 415, <laughs> but then all the system manufacturers, most of them are in the US and so we're still dealing with 480 volt designs and PDUs that are going into our data centers in France. Um, I think on the immersion stuff, I mean, we probably all know the large company in the Houston area that's deployed it at scale before and we've seen a lot of their lessons learned and things like that. It's still, for a, a scale up or a massive deployment doesn't seem to make as much sense yeah, just because it's still challenging yeah i mean you're not buying density i mean you're having to refactor i mean there's there's a lot of good talks from from cgg on their deployments over the years and, and why they went that route and how it helped them deploy faster into and out of their room because they're not modifying the crack units and right and doing all that work um for us, I mean, the voltage, like all these discussions around the way things should be or how we want to see them, it's good to talk about it. But in the end, we don't drive any of it. <laughs> we're consumers. So we're acquiring systems. Um, Total Energies is still willing to do custom systems. We have been for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we were driven from CPU, air-cooled, to water cooled and then GPU purely for our workloads based on power constraints in the particular area where our production system is in France. It's not like Houston where we've got 10 megawatts sitting on the corner we can go grab. It takes three to four years to bring in new power feeds in our particular production location. In Houston, we're a little different. We're inside of a tower, like I mentioned, so we're sharing cooling. Um, that's good and bad because we're not managing the cooling plant or the chillers. 
the facility is giving us 42 degree Fahrenheit water, so we actually have to warm it up so we're not getting condensation into the computer room when we bring it up to the CDUs. Um, we actually turned off our, we do a lot of like on-ramp and testing in Houston, so we've got about a megawatt where we bring different architectures, we're sort of validating and triaging next technology, so we're not bringing in large scale, we're bringing in several racks at a time. Um, but yeah, some of my friends in the room re recall our experiences with the first liquid-cooled systems, and then finding leaks is another thing. Uh, when they're back behind servers and you're finding water, I mean, it's going to follow the least path of resistance, and you're going to find it on the floor. The question is, where did it originate? Right, where did it come from? And we made the major mistake of using this dye to find a leak. Oh, no. And we put in this dye that I think you could change the color of the entire Nile River with, like, two drops of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Most of my sys admins had pink shoes or pink pants um, because we really, we had a leak that, I mean, we could not track down. And part of it was this, this zinc leaching effect that we were talking about where we had the brass valves were getting le uh, wow. zinc leached out of them. I'm so proud of one of my inventions that it was the blind mate dripless quick disconnect. And it was the dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> Let's take a water connector, and when you plug it in, you no longer see where the water is made. So if you could, the sta it's, we, we gave the IP to Stavli, and so it's this connector that floats so that you can, just like when you're server blade mates, and, uh -huh. and we did a billion dollars worth of servers that way, and you'd find the leak when it worked. Because yep. you can do leak detection, by the way. Yeah. But... You know, I see how Dell did leak detection. I know how we've tried it, and and you know, the the best leak detector is when the circuit stops working. Right, it's just hard. You got to contain yeah. it. It's it, it's depending on your orientation. Yeah. So so yeah, having water visible, uh, I think is a good thing right. uh, because you know. So well, and, and it dries it, up because what we were having is the water would leak and it would get to the to the bottom of the floor and then the air yeah, handlers right, evaporated. evaporated. Yeah. So you've got <laughs> so a leak dry. and over <laughs> overnight time your leak is actually gone because the air handlers are evaporating it up off the floor. So I have I have a, one of the things that uh, our secondary fluid is, is that ethylene glycol. Yeah. And the nice thing about it, it glows in black light. Yeah. <laughs> and so all you can do is shine a black light well, in the back of your racks. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and through our through SGI and Cray and, and HP you know, we're, we're telling the world, this is it. There's no, it, it, today we deploy eight different formulas. Now there's only one. Right. 25% propylene glycol mm -hmm. and with the right pH and azoles in it. And you don't need a black light. Yeah. You come in the next morning and it looked like somebody sneezed all over. It leaves a white, it's not <laughs> yeah. a pink residue. It's a but it leaves a white residue. residue. Okay. So, so, so we didn't intend it to be there. It doesn't <laughs> die. But I mean, you, you eventually you, you, will, you will see if it starts to build up. So, if it looks like you've got salt, a salt stain on the floor behind your liquid cool rack, yeah, don't your leak. It. <laughs> yeah, the only other thing on this area of, of dealing with like waste heat and things. So in France, what we did back in 2012, we we did install a heat reclaim system, and so we were reclaiming the heat from our large CPU base. It was approaching five megawatts, and we were heating the campus. Uh, water and also some of the campus offices and we eliminated our use of uh, natural gas to actually heat the, the research campus for a period and then we determined that we're power constrained we need to be more efficient and that's when we made the shift towards a pure GPU system so we got an 11 time power performance reduction over our previous CPU production system but guess what not generating enough heat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we, we gain ground by becoming more efficient, but then at the same time, now we're not generating enough heat. So then we have to go back to it's using natural, natural gas. gas to <laughs> heat Boilers. part of the yeah. campus you, space. You, and, and this is for anybody in the room. I, I, it, you, you guys have talked a couple of times about energy efficiency. And a lot of times I find is that the, the system admin or even the users they don't pay the power bill. Right now, now, now people care because they run out of power at the at, at the at the in row PDU. But a lot of the benefit of water cooling is the is the compressor that's safe for yeah. the chiller plant. Right. But I but I find that as this community here, that's the CEO and the real estate people who are saving <laughs> the money. I mean, do we? Is, I mean, 
you, you'd hate to have a chargeback model for your users. Like, oh, you're trying to charge it, but that's the only way. Is who pays for the facility, right? I, I look at the green 500, and we're in, in, in Frontier is number one on at 1.1 1 .1 exaflops. Is that is that number one on the green 500? But are you including the cooling tower? Well, it and, should. It should encompass. I, I don't know that it does. Well, so part of the problem is if you're on a shared loop and you've got everybody, you know, you need to cap, cap your fraction of the cooling tower you're using. The right. BUE is a great metric still because right. that accounts for that. But I would I would talk. I would ask the people in this room. You know, as you as you look at systems and you advocate for that, you know, I would go to your you know your C suite and say, no, if I'm going to use energy efficient systems, you need to give me that power I'm saving. Right. That that power that you used to run a compressor is going to be in, CPU. So yeah, it's going to go. Put in three more racks <laughs> right, of right, exactly. And take that power off the compressor. Right. We're looking at the total power coming in the building and the transformer limits, and saying if we can move it more stuff to liquid, and go to just uh, evaporative, you know, cooling no, towers. No compressors. We can reuse that power somewhere else mm -hmm. in yeah, the computer I'm, room. I'm, I'm fighting with Equinix and Digital Realty right now, and they're like, no, don't, don't go tell people that. I'm like, no, you should go, if you're doing liquid cooling, they should give you a cheaper rate right. because you're saving them money at the facility. Mm -hmm. Not they should charge you to run liquid in. You're, you're, I mean, they don't like hearing that. Yeah. Well, we, we own the whole building, so. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Well. If we want more computers, we got to find some way to provide the same power. That does lead into the fact that be if you if you aren't don't control your facilities, get very friendly with the people who do, because <laughs> you're going to be having them on site an awful lot uh, compared to the, a lot of the other. Uh, we we have to deal with our university facilities controls all the power and cooling plant and everything. Oh, we have yeah. a we have a very good relationship with them now, <laughs> um, because we are the biggest consumers of power on our. Our research campus. So. There was a question. Some questions are up. I was just going to tell you, Frontier. It was on Bronson's slide yesterday. It's UE is like one point oh three. They're using warm water cooling. Yeah, it, we, that is but but it's unclear if they're including what the chilling plant is is doing in that. We so. we, we, we we help them put in at the site at uh, 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 Oak Ridge fifty megawatts of heat rejection. Our calculation was it was going to use forty, and and our exaflop is twenty seven. You know, and, and again, at a 1.03, because it's just the cooling tower. But again, those sites, it, when, when, when it's almost the green metric, right? Say, hey, if anybody's going to put in the green metric, you got to include the cost of cooling, but that's hard to do in a metric. Right. Okay. Oh, another, another thing that, that I've seen is thermal throttle on you and Infinity is, is pretty extreme. That's. Uh, Coming from a storage vendor, the uh, thermal throttles on uh, NVMe uh, sticks and, and things on the on the actual controllers uh, can be pretty aggressive. So moving to higher temps can cause those to thermal throttle. Is, that, is anybody else seeing throttling? Because I mean, it, as I worked with the people with Lenovo and Dell and all the companies, and we've been designing servers to peak performance at 95 Fahrenheit, 35 C for 20 years. And so whenever I hear somebody say about throttling, and I'm like. That's not right. We, we the industry spends hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of dollars to run, and I'm like, and when I hear people saying, "Oh, well, it throttled," right, or it's anecdotally that it's throttling, and I'm like, well, the early days, the it. early days in the GPUs, we actually had to power cap them. Right. I mean, even the 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 Tesla boxes that go to the HIC cards. I mean, it's we were power capping the GPUs because of the power supplies available to push, you know, four GPUs per box. They weren't there ten years ago. You were capping. Because they were power limits, not thermal limits. They might have power been limits. Power limits. Okay. So we are seeing uh, throttling on our CPUs, both air cooled and even our water cooled ones now. Um, the air cooled ones. So we run 75 degree inlet temperature. It's as cold as our room gets. Is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they've been in service for eight years, and we've actually baked the thermal compound out of the CPUs between the CPUs and the <laughs> uh, coolers. So we see it. We see it every day. Oh, oh it, as it ages. We see them when they're brand new too. Now that throttling we're seeing is new, maybe power related, not cooling related. Yeah. But certainly we do see the cooling stuff 
Yeah, yeah most of the time we see throttling now, it's, it's either something wrong with the power supply, just not delivering, or something in the chassis. We've seen some cases where the chassis gets confused and one node is not talking right and not ramping the fans up. But um, Yeah, we, won't, we see all that I mean, too. As an industry, we're going to have to address it as power goes up and, and water temperatures and air temperatures that throttling during a fault, you know, I think that's acceptable. But from a performance perspective, if we say, hey, this guy can take 32 degree water, this guy can take 40 degree air, you know, then, then, then you know, hold your vendors accountable. You know, hold, hold, H, hold HP accountable, you know, because we know other people don't invest as much in engineering, you know, on it and they just get a box. So we, you know, we, we should know if we're thermal throttling. It shouldn't be a mystery. Yeah. It might, might change with, Things after Genoa and, and Sapphire Rapids HP. <laughs> are you throttling on the water systems? Uh, we are on the newest one, but I think that's probably what we're going to have to. Yeah. yeah, one of the things, I mean, uh, we've had this debate a lot. I mean, it's nice to have throttling to survive some events, yeah. but what we can't have is throttling without any indication from the server that it's throttling. Um, that's what's driven us nuts in a lot of cases is if you get throttling, it, whether it's power supply or thermal, notify it. Got to, got to put a message somewhere in the hardware log, something. I, I said it before. And I, I, want to, I want to say it again and change the way I said it. CPUs draw more power than their nameplate. And yeah. so what's happening is they have mechanisms which curtail the maximum amperage and voltage that they don't call that throttling because they said, no, I never told you it was going to get at that level, especially when you see, you know, the, the burst frequency and all that. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, I, I see it more and more that, that the, the granularity of the mechanism is hard. AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA are all challenged by it. So, so don't be surprised if, if you're seeing throttling related to power. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I think in the industry, we're pushing on it, saying, what is that mechanism? Right. Uh, uh, they, uh, Intel called it I'm on, you know, a current monitoring, and they're saying, well, how much available current that I have on the voltage regulator, and, and that's the algorithm you got to you, you got to get right because they all want to give you more performance <laughs> without breaking something. So yeah, that 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 current throttling to give you peak performance that's probably more common. Mm -hmm. Why don't we allow one last question, <laughs> and then we'll switch to the benchmarking conversation. Anything from anyone? I just have a final comment on, you know, this always goes into a discussion on standards and standardization, and I would, I would caution us to be too standard on everything because that stifles innovation a lot of times. But we know sometimes without standards that we don't meet those economies of scale for these billions and billions of dollars of data centers, but there still does need to be room for, for customization and custom systems because otherwise we we kind of fail to innovate if we're constraining everything too tightly to standardizing on water connectors, on how much water can go to a rack and these things because once the vendors stop making it, then data centers like ours stop being able to innovate and really push the, the bleeding edge of, of technology. Wade, Donnie, Tommy, Kent, thank you very much. This was a great conversation. Thanks for having me.